scripture reading this morning comes from Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 18. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Let me pray for us. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you that we get this time to come and worship you in music, and I pray that we get to worship you through the preaching of the word. I pray today, I thank you today, God, that we get to worship you through communion and through a baptism in the next service, Lord. I thank you for all these things, and I thank you for how you are blessing our church by, by allowing us to come together and worship you in this way. I pray for Jeremy as he brings this word that he would speak your truth boldly. I pray, God, that it would be clear in our ears and that our eyes would be open and we would be sensitive to what you're telling us today. And I pray all this in your precious name, Lord. Amen. with you in song. Now we will worship uh, in reading of scripture and Bible intake. So if you would go ahead and grab your Bibles and turn to Galatians. We're going to look at Galatians chapter 4 and continue this journey uh, talking about how Jesus plus nothing equals everything to us. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And so this morning again we'll be in Galatians chapter 4 looking at verses 1 through 7. As you're turning there, I have a question just by way of introduction this morning, and here's the question I want you to, to really consider. Do you have any idea who you are? And I think that's a question I need you to, to, to really consider in your life. Do some introspect, right? And answer the question, do you have any idea who you are? You see, most people, including believers often lose sight of who they are, especially who they are in Christ. Paul Tripp, he's one, of, he's one of my favorite people to listen to and read his books, he says this, we live as an identity amnesiac, talking about believers. Do we oftentimes forget who we are? And the fact is, people search their whole life trying to answer the question of identity. They seek and search their whole life. Believers included define themselves by other things than God. When I first started ministry here at New Union, I was a youth pastor, and most of the ministry that I did, to especially middle schoolers and including some high schoolers, was, was trying to teach them what it means to have their identity in Christ. That Christ has redefined them. You would think that as I transition into a lead pastor that I would get a group right, of adults that would understand this truth of who they are in Christ Jesus. And I'm here to tell you that I preach the same thing. The same thing. Trying to get people to understand who they are in Christ. You say, what do you mean by that, Pastor? People identify with their past. Sometimes people identify themselves and define themselves by their past. And that's mostly including, right, adults. And I look at them and I want to say, God's grace is sufficient for you. And they can't get over the messiness of their past. So if you have a messy past, let me tell you, let me let you know a little secret. We all do. We all do. And it's not what defines us. That's the beauty of the gospel, church. 
that our old life is gone and we're now raised to a new life in Christ. And this new life in Christ, we are now heirs to the glory of God. It's the beauty of forgiveness. It's the beauty of grace. Well, you don't know who I was in high school. I don't care. And if you do, then you should probably get over that. You don't know who I was either. And I promise you, if, if God put any of our lives up on that screen right now and showed the deep, dark secrets of all of our lives, none of us would be proud. None of us. And so if you identify yourself by your past, you need to stop doing that. Some people identify themselves and they find worth on whether they're married or not. Whether they're married or not. And here's the fact, man, God blessed me with a wonderful wife. I snatched her up. I asked her to marry me when I was 19. You said, why? Maybe you say, why, Pastor? I wanted to get her on the hook before she could figure out she could do a lot better. <laughs> a little truth in that, okay? Um, so at 19, put a ring on it, right? And, and so uh, we, got, we got married at 21, but, man, if God takes me home, she don't lose her identity. She doesn't lose her purpose. She's still got a purpose in this life, and it's not wrapped around me. It's just not. But people find their identity in their past or, or in their married or whether they're married or not. And often people find their identity in their having kids. And even their marriage identity is in having kids. And when their kids get out of the house, they don't even know how to be married again. They don't, still, they don't know how to be married. Because everything revolved around their kids. Or, or then they get older and everything revolves around whether their kids are successful or not. And that's what their whole identity is around. And so when you look at the mirror of your life, where are you finding your worth? Where are you finding your identity? Some people look to money and possessions and status. It all goes away. Kids grow up. Your spouse will one day go to be with the Lord. It's a fact. You can't wrap your identity and your worth around things that will go away. You can't. And then here's, here's, my, here's my favorite one. People wrap their self-worth and identity around how their body looks. Well, let me, let, let me let you in on a little secret. We're all getting old. Whether you want to believe that or not, there's not enough products out there to keep us young. I got beat in a three-point shootout by two ninth-grade girls <laughs> three weeks ago. I would have bet my car that that not, would have not happened. They didn't only beat me, they waxed the floor with me. <laughs> that is the truth. I've put in 10 hours of shooting since then. That's another true statement. <laughs> With my kids, okay? <laughs> but we're getting old, church. It's a good thing that my self-worth is not found in a basketball shoot, a shootout. Because the thing about it is sports goes away as well. When I uh, graduated college, um, I, I didn't. I wasn't a pitcher. I played shortstop, but they would put me into pitch sometimes because I could throw strikes and I could throw hard. And when I graduated college, we had one more game, like to try to win. And I told the coach to put me in, and he did. It was my last college game. And I kind of read the writing on the wall that this may not work out for us to win this game. So I proceeded to throw as absolute hard as I could to see my last game. If I could throw 90-something. I left that game with my arm killing me. Killing me. And somebody said, hey, you going to try to play baseball after this? I said, absolutely not. 
my arm's killing me, and I'm married. Right? Well, I thought that would be the norm for everybody that I graduated with. Like, man, we enjoyed a good college time, right? We played. I proceeded the next year to watch people that I love. This is honest truth. Watch people that I love that are Christians struggle the next year of their life because baseball no longer defined them. They were lost. Never in my mind did I realize that they, they had their whole self-worth in a sport. And I walk around all the time and talk to people all the time. That it may not be a sport, but maybe they're identifying with their past or whether they're married or whether marriage is going well or, or whether their kids are successful or what kids they have or whether they have money or, or whether they have a body or losing their body or losing their looks. And they get all worked up and encompassed in, in that, right? That, that is the measure of them. That that is who they are. And that is whether they are successful or not, is those things. And church, I, I must ask again, is that who you are? Like at the depth of your identity, is that, is that how you identify yourself? Because if you're a believer, you have something far greater to attach to. You have something far greater to be attached to. When you look in the mirror, what does it tell you? I hope that it tells you that you are in Christ. I hope that it tells you that you are forgiven. I hope that it tells you that you have a home in heaven. I hope that it reminds you of who you are in Christ Jesus as someone who is an heir, adopted heir of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So when you look in the mirror, your self-mirror, what does it tell you? What does it tell you? What are you latching on to? What are you anchoring your life to? Is it things of this world that will never satisfy? Or is it Christ? Well, this morning we are going to look at the mirror of truth, the mirror of God's Word. So let's look at Galatians 4. I'm going to read to you verses 1 through 7. Listen to what the Word of God says. I mean that the heir... As long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. Pay attention to verse 3. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. We were enslaved to those. Another great but here. Verse 4, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Verse 6, And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave. So you are no longer a slave. So you are no longer a slave, church, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. First point I want you to get is this. I want you to look at humanity's status. Humanity's status in verse 3. Humanity's status is not, hey, you're a bad sinner and you're a bad sinner, but I'm great. That's not how you define humanity's status. Listen to what it says in verse 3. In the same way, we, we, every one of us, humanity, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. We were slaves to sin. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to Ephesians. Just, just flip a couple pages. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Listen to what verse 1 says. And you were dead. Dead. 
I need you to understand this. This is not barely breathing. You understand what dead means, right? When I, when my sister and I were a kid, we had this dog, right? His name was Rowdy. He was a fat Yorkie. And I mean fat. He got blown every morning. I loved that dog and hated that dog at the same time. He chewed back and gloves. I mean, he's just ridiculous. Slept under my bed. What ain't my dog? Family dog, really my sister's dog. Anyway, Rowdy was chasing a, a girl. And um, girl dog, you know. You get it. All right. He got hit by a car. I come home. I didn't realize I loved this dog. Been in the family for 10 years. And I was like, just throw a little water on him. This is true. Like, just throw a little water on him. He's just hit. He's not dead. No, he was dead. Okay? Dead. And so I need you to understand, when we say something's dead, like, it's, it's dead. All right? And so, and you were dead in your trespasses. You need to hear that. You were hostile against God, slaves to sin, dead. No hope, not breathing, no source of life in you. Dead. And that is humanity's status. Verse 3 of Galatians 2. And we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. All of us. Listen to what verse 3 continues to say. And we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. End of verse 3. All of us. Humanity's status. Sinful. Enemies of God, hostile toward God, lost, dead. The mirror of Scripture tells us humanity status is enemies of God, sinful, and hopeless. This is not good. Okay, that's the picture here that's getting painted in Galatians chapter 4. Now look, Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. But... That while we were dead, while we were hostile, while we were hopeless, but, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law. Reason, why, why did God send his son? Verse 5, to redeem those who were under the law so they might receive adoption as sons. Jesus came. So guess what? Humanity's status was dead. Now there's a status change. Point number two, status change. Status change. Now we are redeemed through Jesus. Now we are adopted as sons. That's who we are now. Jesus plus nothing else is the reason that we have a status change. Jesus plus nothing else. Not our works, not us keeping the law, not our socioeconomic class, not our race. It's Jesus. Jesus is the reason that I, we have a status change. And it came at a cost. It came at Jesus coming from heaven to earth, being born of a virgin, living a sinless life, dying an atoning death on the cross, bearing the wrath of God for us on our behalf. And then being buried and, and, and risen from the grave on the third day. Resurrecting from the grave on the third day. It came at a cost. And Jesus suffered the cost. And paid our sin debt in full. The status change is because of Jesus. It's because of Jesus. So humanity status, dead. Status change through Jesus. Now we have a new status. Point number three. We have a new status. Listen to verse six. And because you are sons, because that's who we are, church, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. God has sent the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, into our hearts. The indwelling Holy Spirit lives inside of us and is the guarantee of our inheritance. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our redemption. That is found in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. The Holy Spirit is in our hearts crying, crying, Abba, Father. Our identifier, who we are anchored to, crying out to our Father on our behalf. That's who we are. 
The new status means that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. The new status means that we have a new identity. This new status means that we are blessed for eternity. Blessed for eternity. You are now His, and He is yours. Forgiven, satisfied, and loved. A home in redemption. So I ask again, who are you, church? Who are you? We don't boast of ourselves. We have nothing to boast of. We boast in who Christ is and what He's done for us. That it's Him plus nothing else is everything to us. It's everything. And so we go and we share the good news with people. We share the news that through Christ we have hope. That's what we sung about this morning. We have hope. Hope in the hard days. Hope in the good days. We have hope for eternity. So through Christ, we show over this world we have hope. When they say, who are you? I am loved. I am satisfied. I have a purpose. I have an eternal home. I am forgiven. That's who I am. That's who I am. So who are you? I spent 16 years of ministry teaching that truth. That you are no longer no longer are you identified by anything else than the fact that you abide in Christ. God offers you this identity even though your past is messy, even though your marriage is hard, even though your kids are growing up, even though your body is fading, even though your sports dreams may be over and your job may not be satisfying, you have purpose and worth and it's found in Christ and not the things of this world it's in Christ so the four takeaways I have for you is this number one all people are born sinful all people me, you, your neighbor, your, your, your kid my kid's perfect oh boy, let's pop that little bubble right now like let's Let's go with it. Well, he wouldn't, but yeah, he would. She, yes, she did. Okay? All of us, sinful. Point number two, God offers redemption through Jesus. And we praise him for that. Number three, believers are sealed with the Holy Spirit for eternity. For eternity. Your identity never changes once you've repented and followed Jesus. And number four, believers have an identity in Christ that will never be shaken. Well, pastor, I failed God. Yep. And he offers forgiveness. He offers love. He offers hope. Won't be shaken. So take a moment. And again, look at the mirror. Look in the mirror. So this time, I don't want you to look in the mirror of this world, false identities, false hope, false satisfaction. Look at the mirror of Galatians 4, 1 through 7. Who are you? If you're a follower of Christ, you praise him for that. Because your purpose and your worth is found in him and not the things of this world. I say amen to that. Take a moment. Answer the question. Look at the mirror. Who are you? People search a lifetime to find the answer to that question. And the answer is, we are in Christ, adopted, co-heirs, completely satisfied. It's who we are. And I can rest in that, can't you? Can't that be enough? Let's pray. God, you are so good. You are worthy of praise and 
honor. And I am so thankful that you love us and that even though we were dead in our trespasses and sins, you sent Jesus, God, to redeem his bride. And so may we as believers be found resting in that truth. That that's what we commit our life to, that in that truth is where we find our identity and our worth and that we anchor our lives to you. To you and you alone. But God, I know there may be some in this room that either are lost and need to know the hope that is found in Jesus. And I pray that you will show them that this morning and they will come repent and follow you. But I also know there's some in here that are really struggling trying to figure out who they are. And today, God, I pray that they will, will anchor to you and find their life anchored and satisfied and, and abiding in the vine in Christ. God, I pray that they work that out. We love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Joey's going to play. And I want you to just take a moment. You can you stay seated. You can pray at your chair. You can come up to this altar if you want to. And I'll be up here. But I want you to take a moment. And I want you to think about the sermon. And in thinking about the sermon, we're about to take the Lord's Supper. And we're about to take and say, this is Jesus' body beaten for us and his blood shed for us. And so this is an opportunity for you right now to say, God, I choose you. I'm reminded of what you've done for me. I, I'm, re I'm repenting of sin, right? I'm turning from sin. I choose you. And so we're going to give you a few moments. Just close your eyes. Be at your seat. If you want to pray up here, I'm up here. Prepare your hearts to take the Lord's Supper and, and also to think about the sermon, all right?